Hi, how are you, my friends? It's me, Dr. Muhammad Kazafi, and you are watching Dr. Muhammad Kazafi View. This is my new video regarding a very common topic which encountered by every neurosurgeon. As you know, I'm basically a neurosurgeon. I'm trying to make a video library of different lectures regarding uh, the neurosurgery and others. Simultaneously, I, am, I want to discuss uh, with you here a topic which is called the normal pressure hydrocephalus. I want to present a one case in front of you for analogy, and uh, I, uh, I know that it will help us to... Uh, a 70 year old male with the history of hypertension and rheumatoid arthritis present to the clinic for evaluation of long standing difficulty walking, urinary uh, uh, incontinence, and uh, memory uh, problems. And his uh, prior workup include the high volume uh, a lumbar pressure puncture and uh, with documented uh, an uh, opening pressure of 15 centimeter of the water uh, and a normal laboratory profile the patient and his wife reported transitly improved gait after the lumbar puncture the past medical history regarding the hypertension and the rheumatoid arthritis I already mentioned and on examination patient was fully alert oriented and, uh, and uh, to, uh, to time place and person uh, um, but the simultaneously he was when I allow him I, I just request requested him just to walk for me so when he walked it was a shuffling unsteady gait and require a walker uh, mild dyskinesia on finger to nose and five by five strength in all major muscle groups and sensation was intact. Cranial nerves second to the 12 all cranial nerve were intact. Uh, definitely my differential diagnosis uh, on top priority according to the age considering all these facts. Uh, the normal pressure hydrocephalus, but other, what other can be? So the what other can be in that regard? Uh, uh, Alzheimer disease could be, Levy body dementia could be, vascular dementia could be, like I told you, hydrocephalus, and uh, maybe it is equiductal stenosis or the obstructive hydrocephalus because of the uh, other reason. Maybe AIDS dementia complex, maybe Lyme uh, neuroborreliosis, maybe urinary tract infection, benign prostatic hypertrophy, hypothyroidism, vitamin B12 deficiency. So all the possibilities cannot be denied here. And if I did the MRI for him, and MRI showed me there is a definitely some brain atrophy associated with the dilatation of the both lateral ventricles. All the horns were dilated, even though I can appreciate the temporal horn. Simultaneously, the most alarming thing on the MRI for me was the complete ballooning of the third ventricle and the dilatation of the third ventricle. So it is very much, uh, I can say, appreciable thing. And for diagnosing the uh, some kind of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, simultaneously, I want to mention you here, the laboratory we did, such as the routine labs, uh, HIV, Lyme, serology, thyroid function or hormone test and the uh, vitamin B12 levels, CT scan, brain uh, uh, done, definitely MRI brain already I mentioned, and MRI, bench, uh, MRI brain with and without contrast, considering a gold standard imaging to assess uh, for the white matter lesions and other lesions. High volume lumbar puncture, uh, puncture or the lumbar drainage to assess the opening pressure which 
already has been done to diagnose this patient and this symptomatic improvement after CSF removal can predict the increased likelihood of the response of shunting. Uh, I took the consultation from the neurology regarding the dementia and uh, before to, you know, proceeding towards the pathophysiology, uh, I want to discuss a little more about the normal pressure hydrocephalus. As, as we know, normal pressure hydrocephalus known with the many, many people. Actually, I wanted to present like this. And uh, the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, potentially reversible cause of dementia, is the most common form of hydrocephalus in adults. Idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is a disorder of the elderly that characteristically presents with progressive gait impairment, cognitive deficits, and the urinary urgency and or incontinence. The Hakim's Art Adams pride classically described by the Colombian neurosurgeon Solomon Hakim and uh, R.D. Adams in 1965 that the gait disturbance with one additional feature is essential to consider the diagnosis. However, the clinical presentation requires further supportive assessment, imaging, and the cerebrospinal fluid drainage for confirmation. Some experts have challenged the term idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus as the intracranial pressure is not always normal in, we can say, normal pressure hydrocephalus. The term idiopathic adult hydrocephalus syndrome has also been proposed like that, for example, the etiology idiopathic which is considered, I wanted to just uh, rephrase like that, the normal pressure hydrocephalus, especially two major forms. One is the idiopathic primary normal pressure hydrocephalus. There is no identified cause, but the symptomatic secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus cases with the risk factor of the earlier brain infection, hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, or radiation contributing to hydrocephalus fall into the category such as common feature of the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus and the secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus are that both are communicating type of hydrocephalus and both carry a similar prognosis. The significant difference between them is that the secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus affects person of all ages while idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is mainly a disease of elderly. Like my patient, he is 70 years old uh, with the known case of hypertension and rheumatoid arthritis, but he also developed the normal pressure hydrocephalus. The pressure was 15 uh, centimeter of water, but simultaneously his uh, uh, MRI telling a lot of things which I already mentioned. As you know, the basal intracranial pressure must be initially elevated for at least some period of time for normal pressure hydrocephalus to develop. But in the most extensive uh, populated base study on the prevalence of the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus in the Western Sudan, the research found that the 0.2% among those in the age group 70 to 79 and 5.9 of those above 80 or 80. So it is a age is a major thing. As I mentioned to you, it is affecting especially the elderly, but the normal pressure hydrocephalus of the secondary type, it can present in any age group. So we have to open our mind for both the things. We cannot say no if the patient's age is less because age definitely a matter but definitely we have to understand there are two kinds of the normal pressure hydrocephalus. One is the primary, which is also called the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, and the other one is the secondary, which you should know that it can present in any age group, but both are both are communicating hydrocephalus. The exact pathophysiological pathway of idiopathic 
normal pressure hydrocephalectomy remains unclear, but several mechanisms have been described leading to the development of the condition. The hyperdynamic flow of cerebrospinal fluid in the aqueduct, reduced compliance of the subarachnoid space, increased CSF pulse pressure, reduced reabsorption of the CSF in the venous system due to increased resistance, reabsorption of CSF through abnormal mechanism like transependymal flow rather than through a subarachnoid or the arachnoid granulation. Cerebral blood flow reduction, altered expression, increased CSF pulse pressure, reduced reabsorption of CSF in the venous system due to increased resistance, reabsorption of CSF through abnormal mechanism like transependymal flow rather than through subarachnoid granulation. Cerebral blood flow reduction, altered expression of the cerebrospinal fluid tumor, necrosis, factor alpha, which is known to regulate CSF production and transforming growth factor beta. Failure of drainage of the vasoactive metabolites, abnormalities in CSF production and turnover may lead to failed clearance of toxic molecule. An inability to clear amyloid B peptoid and tau protein could lead to an increase in their concentration in brain interstitial fluid, creating, creating a potentially hostile environment of the neuronal function and survival. Loss of windskill effect in the skull base arteries, the imbalance of the CSF production and reabsorption is not due to the overproduction, but because of the increased resistance to CSF outflow. The, lo the loss of elasticity of blood vessel may be either primarily due to the atherosclerosis or secondary due to the low craniospinal compliance impending the expansion of the skull base arteries. The increased brain pulsation rate in higher compressive stress and shear forcing in the cerebral parenchyma. Due to the physical and physiological difference between the superficial and the deep periventricular brain tissue, the, the damage and loss start mainly in the periventricular area as a result of cerebro auto compression. This focal brain damage manifests as the ventricular megaly and the loss of the wind scale effect and also result in the lowering of the cerebral blood flow and which lead to the simultaneously occurrence of the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus and cerebral hypoperfusion the, le the, the, the latter in turn lowering CSF turnover. So the cause of the gait abnormality the increased intracranial pressure lead to stretching and compression of the fiber of the corticospinal tract in the corona radiata that supplies the leg and which pass in the close vicinity to the lateral ventricle as a result as a result of interstitial edema. So the poor perfusion of the periventricular white matter and prefrontal region, the compression of the brain stem structure such as the Podunculo conchine nucleus. As you know, <coughs> the cause of the dementia. As you know, the ventricular continuity or ventricles continue to enlarge and the cortex pushes against the inner table of the calvarium. So the radial shearing force lead to dementia and cause of the bladder incontinence. At an early stage, the periventricular sacral fibers of the corticospinal tract are stretched and causing a loss of voluntary supraspinal control of bladder contraction. In later stage of the disease, dementia may contribute to incontinence and also in the patient with the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus the, low, the, the role of the comorbidity should be considered according to the International Society of Hydrocephalus and Cerebrospinal Fluid Disorder. 
it is critical to rule out potential comorbidities that allow for the optimization of the patient's care for each diagnosis, maximizing their clinical outcome. The complete Hakim stride is seen in 50 to 75 percent of the patients with gait and cognitive disturbances and occurring in 80 to 95 percent and urinary incontinence in 50 to 75 percent of the patient. So the complete Hakim stride only in 50 to 75 percent, not in 100 percent. And simultaneously, the gait and the cognitive disturbances occurring in 80 to 95 percent so means that in my patient as i mentioned the gait and the the, the the gait and the cognitive disturbances were there so that's why it is common and it is more suggesting than uh, for my patient that is the normal pressure hydrocephalus urinary incontinence in 50 to 75 percent of the patient International Society of Hydrocephalus and Cerebrospinal Fluid Disorder guideline define probable normal pressure hydrocephalus by the combination of insidious onset gait and dysfunction after 40 years old without precipitating event and lasting at least three to six months in the absence of comorbidities which could fully explain the symptoms. As you know, the gait disturbance is generally the first and the most common symptom to appear, also the first one to resolve postoperatively. So, the occurrence of the gait abnormality before the onset of the cognitive decline has been reported to predict a better prognosis after shunting. The most common description of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus gait is shuffling and magnetic and widespread. Simultaneously, with disease progression, the patient's gait deteriorate and finally become a broad base, slow, short step, and the glue footed, a gait disturbance of the Astasia abstentia type. So, this typical feature of the gait in the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus are following in that manner external restoration in foot posture. Poor foot clearance means fascination, the shuffling and tripping. It is the uh, way of walk. Notable difficulty turning on the body, long axis, multi-step turns, gait initiation failure or freezing of the gait. So these are the typical feature of the gait in the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Disequilibrium in normal pressure hydrocephalus is usually worse with the eye closed, but patients require a broad standing base even with their eye open. The upper body typically is mildly stooped, but retropulsion can also be present, either spontaneous or an proactivity. Motor abnormalities in the upper limbs are either mild or absent and generally restrict to bradykinesia. The slowness of the gait and in the movement of both upper and the lower limb can improve following shunting. A tremor in the extremities which is present in 40% of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus patients does not respond to shunt surgery and the urinary frequency incontinence. The bladder symptoms are due to detrus overactivity which can cause increased frequency and the urgency of the maturation or frank incontinence. For urinary frequency incontinence, I much say, I can't much say more because the is due to the detrusor overactivity and which can cause increased frequency and the urgency of the maturation of the frank incontinence, which I can say. But the dementia of the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is of subcortical type and characteristically present with inertia, 
and forgetfulness and uh, poor executive functions so the forgetfulness and the poor executive function the earliest cognitive sign of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus include the psychomotor retardation reduce attention as well as you can say the executive and the visual potential or you can say vicious perceptual dis uh, dysfunction occurring due to frontal and subcortical dysfunction significant improvement in all these may occur following sh shunting the presence of multiple vascular risk factor influence the severity of the cognitive deficits in spite of the radiological severity of hydrocephalus the choice is usually to prefer surgical treatment of the patient has severe dementia even if he she exhibit gait dysfunction and bladder incontinence the objective examination with the help of the specific psychometric test is necessary for the assessment of the subcortical frontal lobe deficits and the some examples are the grooved pegboard test and the stoop test the digit span test and the trial making a oblique b test and the ray auditory verbal learning test these are the few tests you can perform the details of the test may increase the size of the video but i am i have a lot of things more to discuss here such as the evaluation of the normal pressure hydrocephalus as i mentioned i did for my patient ct scan brain even though the ct can help us in visualizing some anatomical changes in the brain it is not possible to diagnose normal pressure hydrocephalus with this imaging modality alone MRI magnetic resonance imaging MRI is the investigational imaging of choice for normal pressure hydrocephalus to image to image the structural changes CSF flow studies and the magnetic resonance spectroscopy can support the diagnosis of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus the following findings in MRI brain may be suggestive of the normal pressure hydrocephalus a wants index it is the frontal horn ratio defined as the maximal frontal horn ventricular width divided by the transverse inner diameter of the skull and it signifies ventricular enlargement if it is greater than or equal to 0.3 Colossal angle, the angle should be between 40 to 90 degrees in patient with the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, size of the temporal horns, which I specifically mentioned in my case when I was presenting regarding for the analogy of this case that the bitemporal uh, appreciation cannot be denied. in the mri and it is very much suggest suggestive for the normal pressure hydrocephalus disproportionate disproportionate widening of the ventricles in comparison of the cerebral sulci may be present and normal fourth ventricle size in the presence of the lateral and the third ventricle enlargement and not be indicative of equiductal of stenosis and is the finding consistent with normal pressure hydrocephalus dilatation of the temporal horns not entirely attributable to hippocampus atrophy so as i mentioned you know that specifically when i was presenting my case for the analogy i presented that the third and the lateral ventricle dilation dilatation with third ventricle ballooning i called loudly but i didn't mention the fourth ventricle it doesn't mean that i forget 
because it was not, it was the unremarkable. And here, in description of the evaluation, radiological evaluation, is suggesting us in the normal pressure hydrocephalus, the fourth ventricle usually, usually, are with the normal size. So the dilatation of the temporal horn not entirely attributable to the hippocampus atrophy and narrow high convexity sulci, a coronal section at the level of the posterior commissure shows a narrowed subarachnoid space surrounding the outer brain surface, a tight convexity and the narrow medial cistern. So the dilated sylvan fissure, focally dilated sulci disproportionately enlarge subarachnoid space hydrocephalus, or we can say dash. Dash means disproportionately enlarge subarachnoid space hydrocephalus. I am repeating disproportionately enlarge subarachnoid space hydrocephalus is called dash D E S H and this dash sign demonstrates a strong positive predictive value for the 77% however has a weak negative predictive value only 25%. So periventricular hyper hyperdensity in CT or T2 in a fluid attenuated Inversion recovery hyperintensity on MRI represent transependymal edema due to elevated CSF pressure, but may also be seen in a small vessel ischemic disease. There is a bulging of the lateral ventricle roof, upward bowing and stretching of the corpus callosum. CSF flow study, the flow rate of greater than 24.5 ml per minute in 95% is specific for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Equiduct flow void seen in T2 weighted image due to increased CSF flow velocity is not a useful sign. Factors suggesting favorable outcome following shunt surgery such as the equiduct is stroke volume greater than 42 microliters. Lack of white matter lesions on MRI B wave longer than 50% of intracranial pressure monitoring time and the resistance of the CSF outflow over 18 millimeter of mercury. Factors suggesting unfavorable outcome following shunt surgery. Severe dementia, dementia as a presenting symptom, MRI abnormality, cerebral atrophy, and multiple white matter lesions. Misdiagnosis and delayed recognition is also a factor where you can go for surgery, especially the shunt surgery. I want to just repeat this line because it's very important and it may be the very, very uh, important regarding the surgical treatment of this kind of patient, such as the severe, the factor suggesting unfavorable outcome. It's not causing favorable. It is calling factor suggesting unfavorable outcome following shunt surgeries such as severe dementia, dementia as a presenting symptom, MRI abnormalities, cerebral atrophy, multiple white matter lesions, misdiagnosed and delayed recognition. Nuclear medicine in the, uh, studies suggestive for the, some of the non-specific signs seen in idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus are the heart shaped appearance of the lateral ventricle normally shaped like a trident presents persistence of the trace more than 24 to 48 hours in the ventricular system due to impaired absorption and absence of an extension of trace in onto the superior aspect of the lateral ventricle. Backflow of the CSF into the lateral ventricle as you know, the flow, the the, the fluorodeoxyglucose positron emission tomography, we can say FDG PET PET, which is, uh, is a promising imaging modality for the diagnosing normal pressure hydrocephalus and detecting concomitant 
degenerative disease. Invasive diagnostic tests, such as the test of CSF drainage, increase the diagnosis and prognostic accuracy about the 80%. A spinal tap test, as I did in my case, as you know, the lumbar puncture removing of the 30 to 70 ml of CSF, which is repeatable on two or three consecutive days, and there is a continuous subarachnoid drainage from the lumbar spine of 150 to 200 ml of the CSF daily for two to seven days. It has a high sensitivity between 50 to 100 percent and the high positive predictive value 80 to 100 percent to diagnose these cases by that way. And we performed in that. That's why that we found the pressure is 15 centimeter of the water. These tests are considered to be positive if the number of steps the patient takes in a 10 meter gait test and the time needed to walk 10 meters are reduced by not less than 20% and psychometric testing shows an improvement of the least 10%. So the competent and experienced health professional should do the CSF pre and post drainage evaluation because there a specific experience in such cases give us more value rather than if somebody new will do that. So the treatment and the management, as you know what we did in our case, but definitely I will mention what we did, but uh, trial related to idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus, a study of idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus on neurological improvement, a specific features in MRI that suggest feature of idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus as identified in this study were that tight high convexity and the medial subarachnoid space with ventriculomegaly. Disproportionately in large subarachnoid space, hydrocephalus dash is also a very good suggestive sign, which I repeated twice or thrice in this lecture. Patient having the above said feature showed high responsiveness to ventricular peritoneal shunt surgery, and the finding favored lumboperitoneal shunt surgery in patient with the idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus. Both the study suggest that the larger study are needed consider no, lumbar uh, peritoneal shunt as the first line of treatment for the idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus. Shunt valve plus shunt assistance versus shunt valve alone for controlling over drainage on idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus in adults. So the study favored the use of the gravitational valve in patient and undergoing VPS for idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus. Implanting such valves rather than the other type of valve will avoid one additional over drainage complication in about every third patient. A double blind randomized trial on the clinical effectiveness of the different shunt valve setting in idiopathic neuropressure hydrocephalus, the study concluded that there is a no difference in outcome of the valve pressure gain and again gradually reducing from 20 to 4 centimeter of water if it is set as a fixed value of the 12 centimeter of water. So are you changing the gauges and uh, <laughs> and are you putting the constant 12? I think uh, there is no value, no, no, no difference and, the, uh, and the, you, you will get the almost almost same results. Here Definitely multiple trials suggestive for the multiple things and we can uh, go on and go on for that. Uh, where the controversy will come, we can discuss, but I have to uh, a little, I have to tell you about little thing that this medical treatment, there is a no definitive medical therapy for the normal pressure hydrocephalus. Although the reducing CSF production with acetazolamide may be tried and surgically CSF shunting is the treatment of choice for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Ventriculoperitoneal shunting is preferred but the 
lumbo-peritoneal shunt is an option. So the surgical technique I wanted to mention in front of you, for VP shunt, the right lateral ventricle is typically targeted for the catheterization. Usually, image guidance is not the need for catheterizing a large ventricle in normal pressure hydrocephalus, but may be considered for ventricular catheterization in general based on ventricular size and surgeon's preference. Adjustable values are commonly used and the model should be selected that is appropriate for the lower pressure seen in normal pressure hydrocephalus. The cranial entry point to the As you know, the cranial entry point to the, catheter, to the catheterized lateral ventricle is typically based on the surgeon's preference. The familiar option is Cocker's point, which is located three centimeter from the middle line or the mid pupillary line and the one centimeter anterior to the coronal suture. From this point, the catheter is directed perpendicular to the surface of the brain through the frontal loop and into the right frontal horn. Alternatively, Keen's point is located 2.5 to 3 centimeter above and 2.5 to 3 centimeter behind the posterior pinna. From this point, the catheter traverses the posterior parietal loop into the trigone of the lateral ventricle in place to shunt and the Keen's point has the advantage of a shorter and more direct course of the distal catheter to the abdomen. The patient is positioned supine with the head turned such that the cranial access point, abdominal incision and the intervening pathway along the posterior cranium, neck and chest are accessible. The neck should be in relaxed position to avoid jugular obstruction. The entire planned course of the shunt is prepped and draped so that the tunneling device can be seen as it passes in the subcutaneous layer. A J curvilinear cranial incision with the base of the flap posterior avoid placing the incision directly over the burr hole or the catheter upon closing and minimizing or you can say minimizing wound breakdown and infection. A subgalial pocket is created to receive the valve of the shunt. The burr hole is made at the cranial access point. The, the bone edges are wedged. The dura is cauterized and opened sharply. The cortical entry point free of the large veins is identified and the pia is cauterized with bipolar electrocautery. It is advisable to catheterize the ventricle only after the peritoneal axis and cranial to abdominal channeling is complete. A general surgeon sometime help us providing the laparoscopic abdominal axis for an upper quadrant is common and convenient. But here the abdominal incision is made only two centimeter above the rib cage, sorry, below the rib cage. So the dissection is carried out down through the subcutaneous fat to the anterior rectus sheath and this may be incised to the reveal the underlying muscle fiber and generally the fibers are split vertically instead of being cut horizontally so the posterior rectus sheath fascia may be grasped with the small cali clamp and elevated of the underlying bowl. The clamp may be left in place on the fascia for easy identification upon closure 
and with the fascia elevated, it is opened with seizure to avoid heat injury to nearby bone. Preperitoneal fat may be encountered here if herniating preperitoneal fat is obstructing visualization. Reverse stand lumbar position may ease the intraabdominal pressure on the superior abdomen to allow better visualization and the peritoneum graft under direct visualization and elevated off of the underlying bowl after ensuring there is no adherent bowel. Seizures are used to create a small cut with the help of seizure, sorry. Seizures are used to create a, a small cut in the peritoneum and the purse string suture loosely placed at the access site of a small Kali clamp at the edge and may be used to easily find the opening later. Bowel peristalsis or other intraperitoneal structure should be positively identified. The specific process of passing the catheter from the cranial side to the abdominal side may vary based on equipment. In general, catheter passer is tunneled from the cranial pocket to the abdominal incision and relaxing incision may be used along the course as needed if the tunneling device is stuck. Carefully pass the device over the clavicle, avoiding the subclavian vessels and plural space. The stilt is removed and the shunt distal catheter is passed through. Suction and irrigation may help float the So, may have float the catheter through the holopasser. If the holopasser is not available, a strong silk suture may be secured to the catheter to pull it through the track and the, sh and the shunt valve is then primed and secured to the catheter. The ventricular catheter is then inserted and its stellate is removed once the CSF flow is confirmed and the ventricular catheter is cut to an appropriate length and attached to the prevent kinking at the edge of the burr hole and after ensuring flow of the CSF to the distal end of the system, the distal catheter is placed in the peritoneum. The peritoneal purse string suture is tied without obstructing the catheter. Fascia of the abdominal wall should be closed in anatomical layer. You know the complication, avoidance and management patient selection is a key in a improperly selected patient or those with dementia alone will not benefit from shunting. Care must be taken when tunneling over the clavicle to avoid pneumothorax or injury to the subclavian vessel. Consider involving a general surgeon if the patient has a multiple prior abdominal surgery or infection, subdural hematoma may develop from over drainage. If an adjustable valve is used, a higher resistance setting is advisable in the beginning to avoid over drainage. Headache that occur during in the upright position may be a symptom of over drainage. If these headaches develop, instruct the patient to lie flat and consider setting the valve to a higher resistance. In that regard, as a, a almost lecture is a, almost complete, but as you know, this lecture is, has a very high value. Uh, so that's why a uh, few things we cannot leave untold. The standard treatment of the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is the implementation of the ventricular peritoneal shunt with an adjustable valve. Lumboperitoneal shunt have also had an extensive use. So this ETV is used only in those cases with the locally confined infratentorial extraventricular obstruction of the CSF flow. Such an obstruction is usually characterized by the 
protrusion of the lamina terminal, terminalis and the floor of the third ventricle into the adjacent basal cistern. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and the serial drainage lumbar puncture have a role only in non-surgical candidates and prognosis pre-operative and post-operative shunt outcome are measurable with the following validate scale the normal pressure hydrocephalus Japanese scale and the Berg balance scale and dynamic gait index and the functional independence measure and the mini mental status examination and the time up and go these are the few tasks uh, or the few indexes or few scales you can check if you want to otherwise cytokines like CSF interleukin 10 and interleukin 33 could be useful in the diagnosis as well as the follow-up of the patient with the normal pressure hydrocephalus so the cytokine like the interleukin 10 and interleukin 33 is very very high value interleukins we can check complications regarding these kind of patient you know the hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus are frequent with the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus as i mentioned the hypertension was with my patient and uh, the, it also affect the mortality schizophrenia has found to occur three times more frequently among in uh, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus patient compared to the general age population in Finland. Surgical complications related to the shunt, shunt failure, over under drainage or subdural hematoma, infectious less than 1%, all are the things. Surgical complication not related to the shunt, but the seizures and intracerebral hemorrhage can cause these problems. The clinician should perform patient that the following are the chance of improvement of symptoms following shunt surgery, such as the gait impairment, bladder disturbances, gait impairment about 85%, bladder disturbance 80% in early stage and 50 to 60% in late stage, cognitive deficit in 80%. So we have to make a good team, include neurologists, neurosurgeons, urologists, neuroscience specialty training nurse staff, working collaboratively to achieve optimal patient's outcome and nursing care is at most important for these patients as they may suffer from dementia and incontinence in bladder function. I hope I try to explain and uh, this kind of topic with some ambiguities uh, which I try to clear in front of you. I hope you will like it and uh, subscribe me and share my videos as much as possible. Thank you for appreciating me. Thanks at all.